So here we're uh, in this particular class, if you haven't been in it before, we're, uh, we're attempting to review the life of Jesus in chronological order, fitting all the events in sequence. Because we're, uh, we're pretty familiar with the story, but we, haven't, we don't always know exactly the sequence of events. Last week uh, what we did is um, we went over the seven periods of Jesus' life. A little too much there. Seven periods of Jesus' life. These were not the events, you know, the individual events, but they were the periods, how all the Gospels are kind of divided. They follow this particular pattern. You, you can chop it up in different ways, but this is a, a pretty recognized way to uh, divide up the major periods of his life, his boyhood from zero to 12, beginning his public ministry with John the Baptist. And then if you're looking at it chronologically, well then what are the events in his life that happened you know, year after year? Well, you know, like we say, you know, well, was that last Christmas or two Christmases ago or, you know, or when the baby was born or whatever? Well, here they use Passover. So uh, the, the third period from the first to the second, from the second to the third, from the third Passover to the final week. And then of course the last Passover uh, uh, throughout the crucifixion or what they call the Passion of Christ, that's the sixth period. And the seven major period that we talked about last week, resurrection appearances and ascension. Now you didn't, you didn't miss any of the sequences. We're starting that tonight if you weren't here last week. Last week was an introduction, a bit of a review. Uh, tonight we're really going to start the, uh, the, uh, the actual events. Now hopefully you've used the reading guide to read ahead, because remember I told you I, we don't have time to read all of these passages of Scripture, so I'm counting on you to read ahead. You're familiar with the things that we're going to talk about. I'm going to try to put the, the, the events in proper sequence, maybe do some commentary, fill in some information you might not have about the various events uh, that, have taken, uh, that have taken place. And you'll notice on your uh, worksheet tonight that on the back of the worksheet you have the reading list for next week. So if you're a regular Bible reader or a daily Bible reader, you can add this or substitute this for your, um, for your time. So first event. First event is the actual introduction. The introduction of the whole sequence of events, only Luke and John talk about this in both of their first chapters. Luke's gospel is the only one that implies that it was written as a letter, and so the introduction explains the reason for the letter. All the others don't explain why they're writing. Luke's gospel is the most historical in nature and contains the most details. 119 of the total 186 events are described in Luke. So if you're looking for a history, Luke, and you're only going to read one book, Luke is the one to read. On the other hand, John, uh, it's not an introduction, it's a prologue. In the beginning was the word. John announces the theme of his gospel, not why he wrote it, but the theme of his gospel. Different from Luke in that it isn't a letter, different from the others in that Matthew and Mark begin by telling the story from the very beginning of their books. But John's first 18 verses summarizes the life and the purpose of Jesus Christ and defines His nature and source from the very outset of the book. And then in verse 19, he goes on to tell the story beginning with John's preaching. So he starts with John's preaching. And so you have two introductions, one in Luke, one in John, that's the first event. Second event, the genealogies. Genealogies are contained in Matthew and in Luke. Now before any action or personalities are introduced, the genealogy of Jesus is given in order to establish several things. First of all, the genealogies are given um, to establish His place within the Jewish community. I mean, you were a Jew because you belonged to the nation. And your place in the nation was confirmed and maintained in the records of the families and their descendants. They had written records, written genealogies that were kept. 
That's how you proved who you were, if you were in the, in the priestly line or the Levitical uh, line, or whether you were, you know, which tribe you were in, land rights, all of these things were resolved because your name was part of the genealogy. You could trace your family through these genealogies. So um, uh, the first genealogy establishes Jesus within the Jewish community. The second reason is it establishes his direct relationship to David. King David. Prophets told that the Messiah would be a descendant of David of the tribe of Judah. So anyone claiming to be the Messiah, and there were many, anyone claiming to be the Messiah would have to be within this lineage, would have to prove that they belong to that lineage. So Matthew's genealogy describes Jesus' royal genealogy, tracing it from Abraham to David to Joseph and thus his legal authority to claim the title of Messiah. Luke describes his natural descendants from Adam. They're different because the authors choose different people on the list of descendants to mention in order to make their case. They don't mention every single person in the line of descendants. For example, if from Adam to Joseph there were 300 descendants. Well, each author mentions different ones in that lineage. Okay? For example, Matthew starts with Abraham and then he mentions the 103rd descendant, the 107th descendant, the, the 208th descendant, the 286th descendant, so on and so forth, and then he gets to the final one, 300, he gets to Joseph. Luke does it exactly in reverse. He starts with Joseph, the 300th, the, you know, the, third, the last one down, and then he mentions the 297th one, the 295th one, the 284th one, you know, and he works his way back, but he goes all the way back to, to Adam. So genealogies are there to show that Jesus was a Jew, and also that he had a legitimate claim to the role of Messiah, according to the prophets who said that the Messiah would come through David's lineage. So that's why you have those genealogies there. They're not, well, they're for us because we study the prophets, but for the Jews at that time, they would first and foremost look at those things to establish his basic credibility. One thing that's interesting is that after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, all the genealogical records were destroyed. The Romans not only destroyed the temple and the city and the wall and everything down, they also burned all of the genealogical records. There are no genealogical records left. Huh? Well, except this one. That was my last point, thank you. <laughs> except this genealogical record. The only one that actually is kept is here in the New Testament, the one for Jesus. So, some people say, well, you know, the Jews will try to reestablish the temple and so on and so forth. They can't do it, why? Ah, that's good, everybody answers at the same time, that's good. Somebody? Yes? They don't, have the records. they don't have the records. How can you prove you're a priest? How can you prove that you belong to that line? When I was in Israel you know, back in 2000, uh, our guide, you know, uh, uh, Itzak, and I, I you know, we, we went back and forth, we were together for 10 days, so finally I said, so Itzak, I said, what tribe are you from? You know? Oh, I'm from the tribe of Judah. Really? I said, and how do you know that? He says, oral tradition. <laughs> and he was dead serious, <laughs> oral tradition. Okay, anyways, number three, the birth, third event, birth of John the Baptist is announced, only in Luke. And we know the story, a priest named Zacharias married to a woman named Elizabeth, who is the cousin, they say kinsman, but cousin, of Mary of Nazareth. And he's chosen by lot, it says, chosen by lot. And this was a once in a lifetime privilege, chosen by lot to go burn incense in the holy place. You know, the holy place was the ante room before the Holy of Holies, and they would burn incense on the altar there, on the table there. I mean, there were a lot of priests, you know? I mean, there were a lot of people who fit that category, so they couldn't all do it all the time. So it if your name was drawn by lot, wow, it's like hitting a jackpot, you know? You, that was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so Zechariah goes and does his, um, his duty, his priestly duty. And while doing this, an angel appears to tell him that his wife will have a son. She has been barren, not able to have children, and now she is past childbearing age. 
And we know the story, he doubts and he's struck dumb until the child is born. Fourth event, the birth of Jesus is announced. Luke 1, 26 to 38. Like I said, Luke has a lot of historical information. So six months after John's birth is announced, so is Jesus' birth announced. But, the time to the, but, but, but this time to the women, the woman who would bear the child herself, and that is Mary. Notice John's birth is announced to his father first. Jesus' birth is announced to his actual mother. And the angel tells her that unlike John, who would be great in the sight of the Lord and a perpetual Nazarite, meant that he'd taken a vow, no alcohol, no meat. He would be a servant of God, that's why he was a Nazarite. And he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That was who John was. Mary's son would be conceived by supernatural means on a completely different plane. And he would be the long-awaited Messiah. And both would have missions. One would prepare the way for the other. One would announce and introduce and the other would fulfill all that was said about the Messiah in prophecy. Fifth event, Mary visits Elizabeth. Luke 1.39. These are easy because they're all in Luke. So if you read Luke, you know, you, the sequence is pretty easy. Now in the last three months of Elizabeth's pregnancy and during the first three months of her own, Mary visits her elderly cousin and assists her in the final months of her pregnancy. When they meet, Mary pronounces a beautiful poem. Uh, the Bible doesn't call it this, but scholars have referred to it as the Magnificent. And in the poem, she praises God for His goodness to her, the fact that she has the honor of being the mother of the Messiah. Praises Him for His kindness to all who fear Him, His help to those who are oppressed, sending the Messiah, and her peace and her joy at her condition. And the interesting thing about this poem in Luke is that it completely, completely consists of Old Testament scripture. It's not that she's inspired to say something new that has never been said before. She simply, well I won't say simply, but the, the, the amazing thing about it is the entire poem is simply one Old Testament scripture after another, which suggests that Mary uh, knew the scriptures. She knew them well. A holy woman of God indeed. Number six, the birth of John the Baptist, Luke 1, 57 to 80. John is born soon after Mary's departure and his name is given as John. A surprise because no one in Zacharias' family has this name and usually at that time usually included a name of a, of a relative. That's why in the genealogies the same names come back over and over and over again because they would name their children, grandchildren the same, you know, with the same name. When he does, he begins to praise God and he too with references from the Old Testament. I'm going quickly here because this is familiar stuff. Number seven, the angel appears to Joseph. That's the seventh event in sequence. Matthew chapter one, verse 18 to 25. So Matthew tells the story from Joseph's perspective and Luke tells the story from Mary's perspective. That's the difference, okay? So they were betrothed, meaning that the dowry was set. The families got together, agreed on a dowry. The dowry had been set, had been paid for. The commitment to Mary was done. The house was chosen. All that was left was the wedding feast. And the wedding feast was usually one year after the official betrothal. So the idea was the dowry was set, the families would meet, the betrothal was made public. Roughly a year later, the couple would have a wedding feast and from the wedding feast they'd move straight into their into their home. The betrothal was a binding agreement. If you wanted to break the betrothal, you had to get a legal divorce. You had to put someone away legally. Even though the couple had not, quote, consummated their marriage, they hadn't lived together, slept together, or anything like that, nevertheless, they were considered betrothed, promised to, um, to one another. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, now, before the wedding feast, of course, we know the story. Mary is pregnant by the, um, the Holy Spirit. Now some people doubt this, they deny it using several arguments, and you've heard these arguments from agnostics and others. They say that this part was added later on you know, by unknown and uninspired writers, 
or they claim that virgin birth was not held by the early church because the epistles don't write about it. And it's true, if you read the epistles, none of the writers in the epistles refer necessarily to the virgin birth. And some say, well, it's just impossible naturally. In other words, they don't believe in miracles, so they deny the idea of the virgin birth. Of course, the answer to this is that both Matthew and Luke both mention quite specifically the fact that Mary conceived in a miraculous fashion. So you know, if we're going to choose, I'm going to go with the gospel writers first, not with the 20th century commentator. Okay? Just like they both mention that Jesus resurrected in a miraculous fashion. So in my mind, what's more difficult for God to do? To resurrect someone from the dead or to, get, you know, to have a woman conceive a child through a miraculous act? You know, to me, one is not anymore. You know, if you can do one, you can do the other, right? And people who deny the virgin birth, what else do they have to deny? Well, yeah, because if you're denying it as a miracle, then you, you, know, you have no business believing in the resurrection either. All right. So uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Joseph is told by the angel that Mary has conceived by the power of God and he will name the child Jesus. And as you see by the notes, uh, the, the, the term Jesus is the Greek form of the name, the Hebrew name Joshua. And the Hebrew name Joshua means the Lord is salvation. Like Mary, Joseph believed the angel and followed through in obedience. Boy, that pattern always comes back over and over and over again. You believe, you obey. You believe, you obey. Always like that. So she accepts to be pregnant and have the baby. He accepts her pregnancy and prepares to be the father by providing her his name and a home to live in. In Luke 125 it says, he kept her a virgin until she had a son. This means that after she had Jesus, he no longer kept her a virgin. And this explains the sons and the daughters spoken of in other passages. Uh, at least four brothers and two sisters. We read about that in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. So basically Jesus is the eldest of seven that we know of, seven, that are mentioned. Eighth uh, event, the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Something interesting about this. Isn't it interesting that the world places so much importance on the birth of Jesus? I read in the paper today that stores are already putting out their Christmas merchandise. <laughs> I mean, really. I thought they were going, you know, they were over the top when they did it, like around Thanksgiving, but man, it, it's coming out now. It's amazing. They're putting it. So my point is the world puts so much emphasis on the birth of Jesus, but only one writer describes it. The birth of Jesus is only described by one of the four writers. So Jesus was conceived while Mary was betrothed to Joseph, legally married but not yet living together. He was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, according to prophecy, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. The actual giving of names in long distance prophecy is very rare. Very rare, long distance prophecy. I don't mean like you know, 10 years tomorrow, 50 years, but in long centuries in the future, very rare that the prophets use names. The actual giving of names in long distance prophecy, uh, prophecy is very rare, but Micah, the prophet, actually gives the name of the city where the Messiah will be born. Micah chapter five, verse two. And the reason historically was that there was a census and you had to go to your native city to be, convert, uh, to be counted. And Joseph, as we learned through the genealogy, was of the house of David and probably owned a small plot of land and so had to be there for counting purposes. That's how the Jews decided what, you know, where you could own land because the tribes had been divided you know, geographically. All right. Number nine, now we get into some interesting stuff. Angels announce Jesus' birth, Luke 2, 8 to 20. Now historians tell us that shepherds had their flocks out grazing between March and November. So the time of Jesus' birth is somewhere between March and November. 
There's a long story about how December 25th was arbitrarily chosen at one time, but we're, we're really going to stick to you know, the events on, on the Bible here, try not to go in too many directions here. Now that shepherds are the first to know is unusual. This is a more interesting idea than you know, Christmas on the 25th of December, which is a, you know, another story altogether. They were the first to know because they were poor and unimportant. Why would that count? Anybody know? Yeah. And what's the best example of that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Shepherds are common people. Yeah, shepherds are common people. And, and, and what's the best example of Jesus using lowly people to accomplish His will? The apostles, the apostles but go before that. And we've got an example right here. Jesus is born into whose household? Yeah, a young maiden, a young maiden uh, you know, simple, J Joseph's a carpenter, a work, you know, working class people. They were not part of the religious establishment. The shepherds were not. They were, however, symbolic of the type of Messiah Jesus was and representative of the nation of Israel. And so the shepherds represent those who come and worship the new Messiah from His, from his people. Next event, circumcision of Jesus, Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 38. Now here's where it gets interesting when you follow the timeline. Being devout Jews, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem. By the way, from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, five to six miles, not far. They take Him in order to have Him circumcised. How many days? Anybody know? Anybody remember after the birth? Eight days, eight days, that was the law, eight days. So she has the baby, she has time to rest and, you know, and feed him and so on and so forth and then they're off to Jerusalem to have him circumcised. A month later, they return. 33 days later for, pur for a purification rite. Because the law said that after a woman had a baby, a month later she was to go and have a purification rite and you could offer two turtle doves if you were too poor to offer a lamb, and that's what they did. That's what Mary and Joseph did. They were poor. And it was at this time that they met who? Simeon, Simeon and who else? And Anna. And tell me, what is the significance of meeting those two? Okay. Yes. That is correct. It isn't complete. There's another piece to that. Okay. Yes, that, that, was, that was fulfilling a promise to uh, Simeon that God had made to him. But I want you to imagine for a moment that you're Mary and, or Joseph, okay, and you've conceived in a miraculous way and you've learned through a dream that your wife has conceived in a miraculous way, and this child is going to be the Messiah. Who else knows about this? Nobody. So you, know, you have the pregnancy, and you know, the pregnancy is the pregnancy. You know, morning sickness and this and that, whatever, and so on and so forth, and you have the baby, and you know, having a baby is having a baby. Nothing has changed. It doesn't say that it wasn't without pain or distress or whatever, and, and then they, you feed the baby and you, you get back into your routine you know, and, and have the baby circumcised and then a month later you go back to the temple and do all your religious stuff and then you start saying to yourself, did this really happen? I mean, you know what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? They're, they're human beings, they're thinking, wait a minute, is it just me? Am I just imagining this? And so Simeon and Anna confirm to Mary and Joseph, no, you're not dreaming. This is not just in your mind. This is of God. This is really happening. God takes care of every single angle. 
emotionally, spiritually, prophetically for Mary and Joseph. Number 11, the visit of the Magi. Magi, Magi, I mean so many pronunciations. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. Now, tradition shows that the Magi, where are they? Where, where do you usually see them? You know, the, the manger scenes, you know, where do you usually see them? Yeah, they're in front of the manger, right? There are the shepherds, and there's the cow, and there's the donkey, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And then and the Magi are there, and the baby Jesus is in the little manger thing, you know, in the little, you know, actually it's a tr it was a trough. It, was, it, it wasn't a wooden trough, it was a stone trough. They didn't use wooden troughs in those days because they leaked. <laughs> they used wooden troughs that they carved out and they stoned out, and it was a, a, a stone trough. But anyways, you always see that picture. But this picture is not accurate. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, it says that Herod killed children, how old were they? Two years old and under, according to how old the child was, based on the information that he got from who? The Magi. Magi, we're looking for this, this kid here. So if you put all the verses together, here's the order of events. They leave Nazareth to go to Bethlehem for the census. Jesus is born there. They then go to Jerusalem eight days later, not far away, five, six miles, for the circumcision. And then they go back to Nazareth to pack up. And then they go back to Jerusalem for the purification rites, one month later. And they settle in Bethlehem, why? They settle in Bethlehem because they believe Jesus is the Messiah. And where do you think the Messiah should be raised? If you're a normal person, a normal Jew, a mom and a dad, we got this Messiah, we had two prophets confirm that to us, we're going to go to the city of David, the city of the Messiah. This is, this is the normal place where you're going to raise the leader of the people. And after a year or so, the Magi arrive looking for who? The Messiah, according to the star. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says that they came to a house. Not a manger, not a barn. They came to a house. Why would they be in a house? Well, they were living there. Where? In Bethlehem, where Joseph and Mary had settled. They didn't come to a manger, as the pictures and the tra uh, traditions indicate. The weirdest thing I ever seen once was in Japan. Well, I didn't see it, but I'm saying the description of a, a scene in Japan <clears throat> at Christmas time, and they had Santa Claus crucified. <laughs> and they weren't trying to be disrespectful, they were just trying to be all in, you know? <laughs> the confusion that reigns. So Jesus has been announced to the Jews, through whom? Through the, pef through the shepherds. And He's been announced to the Gentiles, through whom? through the Magi. Already when he's born, the announcement of his birth is made through these two vehicles. And his position is confirmed how? Two prophets, man and a woman, at the temple. And we know, or we, some scholars believe that the Magi actually were astrologers and they were counselors uh, to the king in Babylon. All right, the next one, flight, to, flight into Egypt, Matthew chapter two. So Jesus' life and movements were dictated by the prophet's words concerning him. Very important. Remember, everything he did was according to prophecy, especially in Matthew's gospel, because Matthew is always saying, according to the prophets, according to what is written, according to this. It's always about him fulfilling every single prophecy, hundreds of them concerning him. So in Hosea, Chapter 11, verse one, the prophet speaks of the nation of Israel and their experience in Egypt when he says, out of Egypt I will call my son. Now Matthew, what Matthew does is he reaches back and he takes this passage and he applies it to Jesus as he is embodying, embodying the Jewish nation's experience in his own lifetime as he also is forced to live in Egypt for a time. Just like his people were forced to live in Egypt for a time you know, under duress, Jesus embodies that history 
by, by his time in Egypt as a child under duress. Joseph is warned uh, that Herod, in a dream, that Herod will try to destroy the Messiah and told to flee to Egypt. This is after the Magi have come. Now he could have fled to any town, could have gone anywhere in Israel, but in order for scripture to be fulfilled, they had to go to Egypt. You know, the gospel writers, and I read a book about this, the most brain-breaking book I ever read, very complicated book, about how the New Testament writers used the prophecies from the Old Testament, the variety of ways that they used them. And one of the ways is, or one of the ideas is that even if the prophet's words did not specifically state something in context, the gospel writers would use their words to express certain ideas regardless of context. In other words, they'd reach back and grab a passage and they'd pull it out and put it into their writings to fit what it is that they were talking about, regardless of the context. So this was, it's called the liberty of inspiration. God created the proper context and meaning using the same words from the Old Testament to the New. So their move to Egypt was probably financed how? They were poor. Yeah, the Magi, didn't they bring precious things? Gold, incense, more these things were precious things. So that finances you know, their trip and their stay in Egypt. Herod's murder of the innocents, Matthew 2. So soon after the escape, Herod tries to eliminate a seeming threat to his throne. I mean, he didn't get it, did he? He didn't really understand. He just saw, uh-oh, somebody's going to rise up as a king. People are going to recognize this family as a, you know, an heir to my throne. So he's going to get rid of everyone. And um, this was Jesus' maximum age according to the Magi account. Couldn't have been older than two. Now we know that Herod died in 4 BC. So this is why we say, remember the first lesson I explained to you why you know, Jesus was born in 4 BC. You know, somewhere around there. So he was probably a year old when he was taken to Egypt. He stayed in Egypt about a year. Herod dies in 4 BC and Joseph and Mary return at that time, somewhere around that time. Number 14, return to Nazareth. So Joseph and Mary had tried to settle in Bethlehem thinking this is where the Messiah should be raised. So they try to return there after they come back from Egypt. Notice it says they came back to Egypt, went to Bethlehem. Figure, you know, still the same good plan. Maybe we'll get, we'll get close to Jerusalem. So God informs him that Herod is dead and he can return to Israel when he realizes that Herod's son is reigning in the area where he wants to return, which is Bethlehem. He's told to go back to his original home up in Nazareth. And Nazareth was a region further from Herod's you know, headquarters uh, it wasn't a place where anyone expected the Messiah to come from. He was safe. He was kind of hiding in plain sight. You know, it was the city that the prophets said the Messiah would emerge from, but not be born in. And there's the subtle difference. He would emerge from Nazareth. They didn't say he'd be born there. The prophet said he'd be born in Bethlehem. But people at the time especially the Pharisees and the leaders, never quite saw the subtlety between these two ideas. And then 12-year-old Jesus in Jerusalem, that's event number 15, I believe that's the last one, yep, for this time. So Jesus is required to go to the temple for all the feasts, or the Jews were rather, but by the first century this had dropped to one festival per year and that was the feast of the Passover. And Jewish boys reached accountability at 13 years of age. Uh, one of the terms they used was a son of the commandment. You became a son of the commandments at 13, age of accountability. A lot of boys went to the temple at even earlier ages and this was the case with Jesus. The rabbis, I mean the custom is that the rabbis would often find large crowds to teach at those times. And many times the young boys, you know, uh, what, do, what do they call that today when a young boy reaches that age? What, are they, what happens to them? Huh? The bar mitzvah, same idea. So in those days the boys would go, they'd go to the temple, they'd discuss things. 
And so we know Jesus loses, or the parents lose sight of Jesus, they find Him in one such group. They always have a painting of Jesus you know, in the middle of the temple with all the guys. You know, but this, this was a regular thing. The young boys would go there and they would learn. And you know, they were the age of, they became men. And so Jesus follows through on that tradition and yet He's there doing what the others were doing. And his reply to his mother when they found him, did you not know that I had to be in my father's home, shows that he was already at 12 aware of his divine nature and mission. He knew at 12. And these are his first recorded words. After this, uh, there is silence concerning Jesus' early life until the beginning of his ministry at 30. All we know is that he remained with his parents in Nazareth and served as a dutiful son until his public ministry began. You know, I'm not a patient guy. I hate to wait two minutes for my burger at McDonald's. So can you imagine the Son of God, you know, knowing his divine mission, 18 years in submission to his parents? You know, when in Hebrews he says he learned obedience, where do you think he learned it? All right, some lessons. Gives us a little information about Jesus, but a great deal of information about His parents. We can learn a great deal about them. Two things I just want to mention. They were true believers. Their faith cost them something, and yet they continue to believe. I've always said it, and I'll say it again. There is no faith without risk. No faith without risk. If it's a sure thing, there's no faith involved. And that's for anything. That's relationships, church projects, you know, stepping out. If there's no risk, there's no faith involved. I mean, that's okay. Sometimes there is no risk involved. That doesn't mean we have to be on the edge all the time. But when, when we're talking about faith, there's always the element of risk there. And sometimes people say, well, I, I, don't, you know, I want to be sure. Well, sometimes you can't be sure. Sometimes you have to you know, take the step. Can you imagine their life, what it was like? And then secondly, they believe despite their lack of understanding. They continued to believe even though the events were unfolding around them. You know, we believe based on a complete story. We have the complete story, the beginning and the end. Now we don't have the end of our story, but we've been promised what the end of our story will be. But these people, they didn't know the end of the story. Things were just happening you know, as they were living. They didn't know the end, but they trusted the Lord day by day by day. You know, some things in our life are like that, and we need to trust and obey even though the things are not fully worked out yet. Some things just take time to work out in our lives. Those are the moments when our faith is truly tested and formed in the crucible of not knowing the end. All right, that's it. That's the first 15 events. I thank you for your attention.